Cool. Yeah, so there is a lot of content, so I'm going to try to go through a bunch of stuff uh, fairly quickly because I'm, I'm sure people are hungry at this point. So if we um, look at desktop Linux development over the years, it's pretty much always started out in C or C++. Most of us that have been doing this a long time are still doing that, but um, it's somewhat difficult for uh, getting people up to speed. But we also have these build systems from the last millennium, like auto tools uh, that we're all super used to, but it's kind of uh, uh, it's, it's showing its age. And then on top of this, you know, this uh, mentality we have in the open source desktop, free software desktop, is that uh, everybody kind of can build their own system the, the way they want to, and that shows a, a creates a very large problem for software developers, which is that everybody's system is bespoke, it's all different, and we end up dealing with a lot of problems. It's just like, well, I can't reproduce your problem, so, you know, E works for me, and close the bug. Furthermore, the applications that we build are often released as part of the Linux distribution. Historically, we've used our package manager to install applications, and, you know, what that means is the applications are only really getting updated as the user updates their operating system. But the amount of effort that goes into building an operating system is significantly more than goes into building any application. So to hold the rate at which we update applications back to the rate at which we need to perform uh, the rigorous development of building operating systems is just a impedance mismatch. And we're the only platform that does it. And in some ways it was our strength early on, but at this point it's now at the rate at which we can develop software. It's, it's significantly holding us back. Furthermore, debugging on each of these bespoke systems out there for us is nearly impossible. I know before I was working on the Flatpak version of Builder, uh, you know, I would spend a significant amount of time and sometimes I would even ask users to like let me remote into their system so I could see problems better. And it's just uh, something that we need to think about as we build our, our future platforms so that we don't exacerbate that. But this, uh, this ethos of our, of our you know, community here is that we really value independence in many ways of our lives, but the side effect of that is fragmentation, or many would assume. So in this process that I've, I've been focusing on is how do we modernize our development platform, and it's, it's really important to us because if we don't get people past that initial step of getting a development environment on their system and get them started, we're going to lose them early. And if we can convert, say, 1% of our users into developers, we'll be hugely successful. But if we put them into a system for which we can only get 0.1% of those users to contribute to our system, it's going to be significantly more difficult. So anything we can do to increase that percentage point of users that turn into contributors you know, it, it creates this um, uh, lifeblood of our, of our platform. But uh, given how this explosion of software development across all markets in the world uh, has created new expectations, as other platforms have lowered their barriers, they now expect those lower barriers from us, and, and we do need to chase them uh, if we're going to stay relevant. But this level of fragmentation we have uh, you know, it, it, it makes it, it's not just, you know, difficult bugs that we need to track down, it, it actually makes it really difficult to write really high quality software because we spend so much time in the weeds uh, fixing duplicated bugs or tracking them down that we don't have the time to work on the features that the users actually want to uh, do new and exciting things. So if we're going to make ourselves more efficient, uh, one area in which we can do that is, is reducing this, like, duplication and fragmentation. So the question, you know, I want to propose is like, can we maintain our independence that we value without uh, creating such a fragmented ecosystem? And in that, can we separate the applications from the OS without losing the long-term stability that users value from getting their applications from a distribution, a rigorously engineered distribution? And can we empower the software vendors to ship more software in less time to more users? And for me, I have always loved, you know, this, I, this ambition of the Linux desktop that we'll try uh, to create new and interesting ideas or uh, have, be a playground for learning. And so can we, can we do this without sacrificing that at the same time? 
But I want to take a moment to talk about why it's so hard for new people to contribute. This, uh, you know, com with open source and free software, like, we have a tendency to say, well, you can go read the code, I don't need to document it very well. And it's very difficult for someone coming in on the internet who doesn't even necessarily know how to get that software to go and learn how these systems are working. So we really need to focus on the documentation. And, you know, we've been saying it for years and we have some action on it, but uh, we definitely need to step that up. And uh, can we uh, fix this like incompatibility we have uh, for if I'm developing a application against a particular library and the distribution has a different version of that library, uh, you know, if I'm going to ship this application to 10 different, or 10 different users on 10 different Linux distributions and they all have different versions of libz for compression, that's not going to make my life particularly easy as a developer. So can we solve that? And uh, wide scale app distribution is already really difficult. It's extremely expensive. And, uh, you know, doing that over and over again in each distribution costs a significant amount of money. So it's really a, even a fiduciary duty f for us as our community to bring down the cost of development and we can't keep duplicating that across every Linux distribution. Workstation setup is really high. Uh, we've done really uh, we've done really good movements in the last couple of years in terms of bringing that process down. But like, what else can we keep doing? How can we keep pushing that? I do think it, at this point in time, our ability to go from a empty desktop to a developer workstation is faster than any of the other platforms. We really can uh, install a single app and have like all of our SDKs and everything loaded here in a matter of minutes. And that's like absolutely great. But now that we've done that, what do we do next? And uh, the fragmentation leaves, definitely leaves people that are trying to develop. If you ever see them in the IRC channels, they're like, well, what do I do about this? And then it's like, well, it's complicated. You have this other version of the distribution. And, uh, you know, it just leaves people often in inaction. And they just kind of choose one and leave all the other distributions uh, by the wayside. Uh, we also often have shifting or different priorities. So, uh, especially as we have somewhat overlapping communities, say like different desktop communities or different um, systems plumbing communities, uh, you know, that, that creates a, a quite difficult um, choice by a developer to have to know what platform they're going to target to get the most users despite none of us getting enough information to know where the users are. We're all super secret about where, you know, how many users does our Linux distribution have? Well. If people don't have those numbers, how are they going to choose which one to target, right? Ideally, it would make it so you don't have to choose one. A lack of training materials is, is definitely a thing. It's something I tried to work a bit on in the GNOME University project, but I had gotten uh, so stuck with trying to teach people different tooling that I realized that we had to go build Builder in the process. But, you know, we still have more training materials to write. And of course, too many technologies to learn at once. Uh, in terms of getting our system set up, uh, one of the questions I get asked most in the Builder IRC channel is like, uh, what Linux distribution do you use? So I can copy your setup. That to me is uh, a side effect of, or like that to me is the symptom of the fragmentation that we're dealing with. Like it shouldn't require you to use a particular Linux distribution, right? But if our setup is that difficult, that's going to be the easiest way that people have to, you know, to get something working. They're just going to, okay, I'll just use that Linux distribution. And I don't think that's good for anyone. Uh, also, the dependencies that we're using outpace the uh, stable uh, Linux distributions we're using. So if someone's using like a long-term uh, stable distro and they want to work on upstream GNOME, oftentimes, you know, we have that immediate sigh when they ask us how to get started and it's like, well, okay, you need to get JH build uh, or you need to update your Linux distribution to something newer and at that point people just walk away and don't contribute. So again, if we're going to get these percentages up but where people turn from users into contributors, we have to uh, deal with these barriers. One of, the, one of the problems I have is actually just getting good stack traces from users. If they get a crash or something, how can I replicate their system on any, like, you know, if they're on a, it's likely they're on a different distribution than me. 
So how can I replicate their particular problem? So if we just take a step back here and think about like how we've changed things, uh, continuous integration uh, has been a huge deal for us because now we know before we even deal with like uh, uh, merge requests and, and releases whether or not we're you know building successfully. Getting all of these debugging, memory debugging tools, we have a lot of code in C and uh, you know it's very difficult to write secure C and uh, getting these tools in our system help because when we have new people coming into the platform, they're not necessarily experts on these lower level languages. They develop that over time in our community and we need to give them the tools to be able to um, grow and, and build as engineers. You know, the good news is that Git and by extension the hosting, Git hosting platforms have won and so we're all finally on the same version control system these days. Uh, you know, that's very helpful for us as we deal with other um, overlapping communities. We have, you know, a, a great amount of uh, programming language diversity and thanks to the platforms that we've been building, it, it really doesn't matter what language you choose to write your software in. Uh, we're getting new types of devices and that's, you know, really interesting for us as we start to target, uh, you know, tablets and phones uh, using the same platforms that we have been traditionally writing desktop server laptop software for. Our tool chains are great and as you saw if, if you're here for the last talk, we're even getting cross compiling tool chains working in containers so that allows us to very quickly target ARM tool chains for you know embedded devices from our desktops. We have uh, OpenGL, Vulkan, et cetera stacks that are actually reliable and high quality. Ten years ago that wasn't the case. But like we, uh, let's think about like where we're going to be going though with this. I think that um, an immutable base OS of some sort with uh, reliable OS updates is very likely in our future as the ecosystem. There's just so many high quality uh, value things from like security and uh, trust and uh, building systems that don't break that the the, the, to me that's very clearly the future for our ecosystem. But as we do that, we now have to think about containers for our applications. It's, it really becomes a necessity so that we can separate these two different platforms and that we can keep the uh, base OS in this uh, immutable form. We need to create stricter sandboxes so that users can trust the applications and trust that those applications aren't intrusive upon their data, their personal information and uploading that to places they don't know. We need to support new types of computing devices and uh, we need to think about how we uh, elevate privileges to users uh, in a safe fashion uh, that doesn't require people to just, you know, use sudo or su to uh, bypass security. And one of the ones I'm kind of excited about is as we move to containers, we can actually increase our language diversity. Right now, there's a, a number of programming languages that are quite difficult using traditional distributions because the amount of effort it goes into maintain those languages on distributions is quite high. So people just, you know, may not use them. But as we start to move to containerized uh, applications, uh, you can just bring that language tool chain with you and bring just what you need. So most people know me for, for working on Builder uh, and I think it's fair to say that Builder was the first container native IDE and by that I mean it was written for containers to build applications in containers. And you know, it, it is written in C, it's incredibly memory conscientious if you look at the runtime overhead of Builder, it's uh, compared to web browsers and other web browser like editors. Uh, you'll find that the memory overhead is about a tenth of uh, the competition. Uh, we're asynchronous across the entire design uh, from the core. Uh, our text editor is a, a B tree and rope based text editor. Uh, we have incredibly good smooth scrolling which you'll notice the other editors don't have and uh, we work great on high DPI systems. We have UI designers integrated and whatnot. 
Uh, you can integrate with Builder in a number of languages, so if you want to write extensions to Builder, you can, you know, uh, add the features you need. And we are very accepting of those features upstream. We generally, if we find someone wrote a plugin, we try to get it upstream as quick as possible. And the main reason for that is, uh, if I'm going to change uh, API inside a builder, I don't want to break people's plugins. So it's easier for me to just go fix your plugin as part of the change, and uh, we maintain that upstream. Uh, we have unit test integration, debuggers, uh, a profiler based on sysprof, which is another project I maintain, to uh, help us find performance issues on the platform. We have auto-completion, diagnostics, quick fix-its, terminals, et cetera. Uh, we support right now currently 10 build systems and more. Uh, if you install Builder via Flatpak, you can have both a developer workstation set up and all of your SDKs you need to build applications in a, really a matter of a couple clicks. Uh, I think th when I tried it on Windows and Mac recently, uh, it was at least in the tens or twenties to get your workstation set up. So like, I, I really do think that we have the easiest platform to get a developer workstation set up today of any uh, operating system. Uh, we index all of your code. We have a, uh, in my previous life I used to work writing databases and so we wrote a really fast fuzzy text search engine for Builder. So any symbol across your project. I mean we're, we can search uh, half a million symbols in like a millisecond. So it's really quite good. Uh, and in doing so we avoid being language uh, like we don't, we don't want to choose the languages you use. We try to be fairly language agnostic. So the code in indexers and whatnot are fairly um, liberal in the in what they index. We have multi-monitor support. I personally just use one monitor, but we have a lot of people that are uh, get those fancy four screen setups and uh, a lot of semantic code features. And by that I mean we uh, extend the editor to know about the language in which you're working with. Uh, we have these code execution ex abstractions that allow us to uh, not just run code in a container, but we can even run code in a container that's of a different architecture. So if you're targeting an ARM embedded device, uh, we can run QEMU as part of the process and actually build your application inside of QEMU uh, for a completely different architecture. So that's, it makes bringing up uh, new development platforms pretty easy because you don't have to build your cross tool chain and everything up front. Uh, we also have some deployment APIs so that if you, when you go to click run, we can uh, ship that program off to the device and run it there instead of on your local workstation. We still have some work to do to be able to do remote debugging and remote profiling, but um, I do anticipate that by our next release in March. So the thing that I like the most is that by improving Builder, we improve our platform. Whereas if we go out and improve all these other toolings, uh, like other editors and, and tools, we don't really make our community stronger at the same time. And so one of my focus for doing Builder and for doing all of the container and flat pack work is that I want to enrich our community with my effort. So if we kind of check ourselves to see if we're improving the system, you know, is contributing getting easier and easier as we build these tools. We're able to uh, preserve our independence because you can bring whatever distribution you like. Uh, you know, Builder is deployed on Flatpak, so it sits on top of that operating system. It's easy to install from GNOME software or any of the uh, distribution markets that you have. Uh, getting these tool chains set up for your newcomers where all of your developers are working on the same tool chain for your app helps a lot and that just is handled for you by Builder. And if you're working on uh, contributing to a core GNOME app, it's really just one click. Once you get Builder up, you can just select the newcomer app that you're working on. It'll automatically clone the application, set up the build environment, and uh, you're pretty much good to go. And so for me, to get that, that uh, percentage increase, the going from say like 0.1% to 1%, uh, I think it's important to get us to a contributors first patch as quick as possible. So I think we can actually reduce the time to getting that first patch in because we no longer uh, waste a day, a weekend, a week on setting up uh, newcomers workstations. So this next part of the talk is going to be a little bit more focused on what we had to do to make this possible. Because we're running in containers, we're kind of uh, 
pioneering the really rough edges of the container APIs in Linux. So one of the first really difficult challenges we ran into was uh, PTY namespaces. And a PTY is a pseudo terminal. So if you're used to, before you get X or Wayland up, you see all of like the terminal output. A PTY is like that, but it's what you see in say like Xterm or Gnome terminal. And uh, they're incredibly complicated historically because it's the same design we used on remote workstations in the 80s. And it's kind of just been extended to continue to work into 30 years later. And for us to do this, we need to run a terminal in another container, but we need to have control of one side of the terminal, because these terminals are broken into two sides. You have like the controller side, and then you have the uh, client processing side that is where it runs in the application area. And we want the controlling side to be inside a builder, so you're just using a new terminal there. And some shells like ZSH want to coordinate with other terminals that you've run. So if you've like started three or four tabs in your terminal, uh, some shells like ZSH will try to discover those other tabs and negotiate things like history management, and they try to like merge them all in the background. But when you're running all of these in different container namespaces, it starts to get confused pretty quick. So one of the open areas we have to work on is to get those shells upstream to become uh, PTY namespace aware. Uh, but you know, if we're inside of a container and builder, we need to get access to what the preferred shell is of the user, and that information's on the host. So we have to kind of you know finagle our way in getting data off of the host machine uh, in a way uh, that allows us to discover what we need to have access to in another container and, and fallbacks because your preferred shell might be ZSH, but if we want to run inside the build container, your build container may not have that. Furthermore, a lot of the stuff that we do is with file descriptor passing. And so we need the, uh, we need a way to be able to execute applications and, uh, pass these file descriptors. So if I'm going to be doing something in a Docker container, I might be running with Podman to uh, execute some of these processes. So uh, let's say that I need to control GDB in your build container so that you can debug your application. To do that, I need to have a file descriptor that uh, is controlling GDB, the input output, so I can submit commands like, you know, stop here, add a breakpoint, et cetera. And I need that to happen inside the build container. So I need to get a GDB inside of Podman inside this other place and pass this file descriptor all the way into it so that me out here in the application can control it. And uh, we had to go add features to various tools to be able to ensure that we could do this so that we have a zero configuration uh, container support. And not too long ago, Podman added this feature for us so that we could support it in Builder. Now that we're getting access to um, GDB, let's say we, uh, the code, you, you stop the code and it, we have a breakpoint now. Where does that breakpoint exist? Well, the path namespace that you may have inside your build container could look completely different from what is on the host system where all your files are. So we need to be able to translate those paths back and forth. Uh, so we need to have enough code that knows an, uh, about both sides and can translate um, uh, from the build paths to wherever your debug symbols are and whatnot. This is very, uh, much more complicated when you are trying to use an existing uh, editor IDE on top of Flatpak because uh, they're not a container aware. And so you can kind of finagle things a little bit to, to work, but to make it really high quality, you kind of need this code. Uh, I mentioned controlling GDB. Okay, so sysprof is a profiler I have for, uh, it's a whole system profiler. And by that I mean it's, uh, it's sampling and it's sampling your whole system. So whether or not you're running code in the kernel or your application or the compositor or whatever, it's taking samples from all of them and, and putting them together. And uh, getting access to, the way this works is, uh, you know, we ask the, computer, what are all of the functions on the stack right now? And so we get this array of instruction pointers. And it's just, they're just addresses. 
but to get access to the symbol name, so you can say, oh, okay, it's, you know, GTK application run is calling this other thing, this other thing or whatever. We need to figure out what the symbol names are. And to do that, we need to take the address relative to the library load location, figure out the offset, find the debug file, then find the table in that debug file that points us to the right symbol name. That'll be between two addresses. Now, that means we have to deal with the path translations and also possibly escaping out of our container to get this data. Uh, so again, we have to sometimes reach into the host system through Flatpak and, and get access to uh, symbols that might be in another container namespace. Okay, so running your application, uh, in, in this case, most of it's done on top of Flatpak, uh, which executes things for us, but uh, some distributions don't support user namespaces, and what user namespaces allow us to do is to create a new container from our user without having to become root first. And bubble wrap will deal with this uh, for us, uh, which is dealt with by Flatpak itself, or bubble wrap will be used by Flatpak, and it can handle running as a sewage process for systems that don't support user namespaces. So that makes it a lot easier for us to just say, okay, you know, you're developing this example app and uh, Flatpak go run it for us in this co uh, new container and then uh, hook in the particular pieces we need to debug, et cetera. And you can also see we do this, we support this for Podman and JH build as well and we can do it for whatever new container system comes out so long as we have the ability to pass those file descriptors around. Kind of the, the hot thing for editors now is these language servers and the idea is that your language community, whether it's like C Sharp, Java, Python, et cetera, they build a, a language server that can do things like support information to the IDE about auto-completion and uh, where your diagnostics are. So it's convenient because we can write that code once, we can share it between VS Code, Atom, Builder, et cetera but uh, it does really complicate the build environment and that's because those tools often duplicate all the build system introspection. So if you want to build a C program, you need to know what the compiler flags are gonna be for your compiler for that particular file. And as these language servers get built, they just kinda choose a build system that they think people are using and try to extract the data from it. So that becomes problematic for us because we support some 10 different build systems. Uh, mostly in that sense, uh, we've duplicated some of the effort and built our own language servers and in other times we just go work upstream and try to patch the language servers to support um, or to remove the necessity for them to introspect on the build system and we'll instead provide the right build system data to them. Uh, what you're seeing now with the recent uh, free desktop SDK releases is we're starting to get some of the language servers bundled in the SDKs, uh, SDK extensions. This is really useful for languages like Rust where uh, people want to run the RLS Rust language server to get auto-completion and by bundling it as part of the SDK extension, it allows us to have the language server running in your build container. And that's important because now the language server has access to the right uh, headers and dependencies, et cetera, that your project will be using. If we don't have that, we have to run the language server on your host container. Uh, and that means that you may have different headers for libraries or the libraries may not exist at all or they may be version incompatible. So you might get the wrong data and the wrong errors and all of that in the IDE. So this is a really big thing for us and it makes setting up developer workstations on exotic languages even easier. It'll, it's really going to be the same number of clicks as it is for a normal developer workstation. And just as a, a, a point of note, the language server protocol is pretty good but it uses JSON and it's really laughably slow in terms of performance. So when you're requesting the completion for uh, at a particular, let's say you do, you start typing a function name and you want all of the functions that match that. If you're in C or C++, you're using Clang to get that data, you could have 250,000 results back. And so if you're spending your time parsing two megabytes of JSON when the user wants to get updated every key press, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, so we have some work around this to make it a lot easier. We wrote a custom 
Clang language server that will serialize the data into G variant and we pass that between the processes and in doing so uh, there's this feature of G variant that you can introspect inside the this data blob without any parsing and we can reference all of the strings inside it. So we've built a system that has zero parsing of our completion data and we just have one memory allocation for the whole chunk of data and so that allows us to do really blindingly fast auto completion. And kind of as an, a point of note here, most of the language servers out there are kind of experimental. They're not particularly that great and in terms of robustness and so it's important that we can kind of recycle the process as needed because they get stuck all the time. So for SDK management, this is the, the piece that lets us get a user set up really quickly. Uh, generally, we are Flatpak and OS tree based. We do support other uh, container systems, but the ones that get the most effort from me are Flatpak and OS tree. And uh, as I mentioned before, we have those SDK extensions. We get everything bundled together. You don't have to worry about setting up some special tool chain for languages. It's just, it's automatically downloaded and maintained by builder for you and set up in your build environment. And furthermore, we get incremental updates. So as a CVE release comes out for the SDKs, you know, we'll take care of downloading that for you and ensure that your uh, build uh, environment gets updated. And also, we don't have to, you don't have to run builder to update your SDKs. GNOME software can just do that for you as part of its normal update sequence. And for those that aren't familiar, OS tree, which is what Flatpak is built upon, uh, it's essentially Git for binaries. You can do incremental updates between two versions. So uh, even though it's this tree of objects, you can say take two points in time and build an optimal update between those two points. And uh, you know, usually that'll get done for the last couple releases. So if you're staying up to date on them, you can get very small compressed updates. It's content address, so you automatically get deduplication. And it's a hard link farm because it's the most uh, widely supported feature of any of the file systems we have on Linux. And it's also what's powering Fedora Silverblue, which used to be called Atomic. Uh, Flatpak itself is sandboxed. Uh, it's using all the new container technologies that keeps us isolated from the system and the OS tree bits to give us the uh, uh, container deployments. Um, runtime and app split helps us keep the updates quite small for the SDK updates. And the portals are what are giving us the safe escalation of uh, sandbox features. And furthermore, we can even use it on top of read-only OS's like Silverblue or even live CDs. The SDK extensions are really just a, additional runtime that get merged in with your SDK. And those generally include like cross-compilers or a uh, language compiler, et cetera. Again, these are deduplicated with OS tree. So if you have SDKs that somewhat overlap in terms of tooling, uh, that automatically gets compressed for you. The uh, last item on here is mentioning the language servers integrated in the SDK extensions. Uh, in the last couple months, Rust, I know, is one of them that supports that and I expect the Mono one at least in the not too distant future to, to gain one as well. And it would be nice if we could have it in Python and, and Ruby, et cetera. And like I said, we automatically install them. And uh, these SDKs are uh, not necessarily designed to be re reproducible but we kind of get it on accident because we've built all of these different systems to share their build environments, you have less chances for things to be different and by the things being very similar, you're more likely to get reproducible builds. Quick note on plugins, we have a ton of extension points in Builder in case you want to add features to make this process for uh, GNOME developers better. Uh, it's all over the place. I'm going to skip through this because we're a little short on time. And then uh, writing builder plugins uh, in a number of languages, um, it's really quite simple. You just need two files. You need a plugin description file and you need uh, actual plugin implementation. And just to make this somewhat short, uh, we'll d uh, show an example here in Python. And uh, this in general, it works by subclassing, uh, uh, implementing an interface of a plugin extension point. So if you wanted to be able to do something every time a file is saved or loaded, you would just uh, create a new plugin manifest and then this would be your code here. You have a function that's, you know, the file gets loaded, where's it getting saved and what's the content and uh, 
and whatnot for both file loading and saving. I don't think I have a demo ready for this because everybody's seen Builder, but uh, my plans in the upcoming future are definitely around getting more language servers integrated and in the next release I want to try to focus on simulators so we can start saying uh, if I want to target this IoT device, how do we get uh, QEMU set up with all of the right components and um, knowing what features the device has, so like maybe it has like a network card, maybe it has a, a WLAN, et cetera. Uh, how do we control those with the virtual hardware in the simulator and allow people to be able to uh, develop locally without having to have the physical device. Um, I have some work in the progress for trying to get the Librem 5 stuff working a little bit better so that you can just plug in the device and, and debug remotely. Um, more containers, more tooling integration, and uh, version control, database, et cetera. Um, the simulator and device simulation is a little bit different, but in the same uh, desires. A longer term, I think it would be nice if we could do our entire deployment, like release cycle and deploy to FlatHub. Uh, all from the IDE and uh, documentation, et cetera. Uh, one of the things I've been doing this cycle is moving a lot of stuff out of process, and that is both for security and process resilience, uh, making sure that Builder never crashes. So I guess with that, we can open up to questions. I know there's a ton of stuff, so. Microphone. So w with the Plotman support, have you given any uh, thought to adding more support for web-like ID, like NPM support? And, you know? We do actually have NPM support. So if you open it up with the proper JS file in your project, when you open that project, we'll discover that you're using NPM as your build system, and the build pipeline will automatically configure NPM in the right stages. Uh, I guess the next step is dealing with like deployments, like what does run look like? I don't yeah, think we but, have- but that would be like NPM on your hosts, but like yeah. if you also could make it have some kind of default base image and download that and run, thing, run the build in Podman and like. Oh no, I haven't. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess when you get to there, do we start thinking about using Docker file and then using build duh? With, yeah, with my Boston yeah, accent. I, I'm just thinking, up. I mean, uh, you're all, almost all the way to be able to do a good web ID yeah. too, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it comes down to like, what does that image look like? Um, do we just like make our own and use it? Or do we like let people choose what that is? A lot of people seem to using the Alpine one, but we could use uh, like the, the new Rel8. Yeah. Like free. To, and do um, people that use NPM expect to be able to update NPM itself, or is it like, I, I'm just trying to think of like what would you. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a great person to ask, but yeah. I think it's, it would be interesting to move towards something where you can use this for. for yeah, if anybody. A lot, because a lot of Linux users are actually like back end developers. Or yeah, if people developers. are familiar with those tool chains, just send me an email uh, with what you would, how you would want it to work. I generally just take all that info and then kind of use that to refine my work process. Other questions? Lunch going once, twice, lunchtime. Thank you very much.